terrible things happen and miracles happen. So what may seem unchanging, it could change very, very suddenly. It happens. It does happen. Those things are called miracles and they do occur, but it has to start with intention and you have that power. You have that capacity. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever struggled to find meaning or direction during this pandemic time, can't even believe I'm saying that, then do we have the hope-filled Man Search for Meaning show for you. Today I'll be talking with Mitch Horowitz, a leader in the New Thought Movement, Penn Award-winning historian, the author of The Miracle Club and the Napoleon Hill Success Course series, which includes The Miracle of a Definite Chief Aim, One Simple Idea, and his latest, Secrets of Self-Mastery. Today we'll talk about one of the most important books of the last century, and perhaps now more than ever, Dr. Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. That's just what I want to talk with him about today, about the primary purpose of life and what it means for all of us during this time. So welcome back to the show, Mitch. Are you ready to shine? Yes, sir. Good to see you. Good to see you as well, and woohoo! And I can't believe I was going to go there as a first question. This is completely unplanned, but can you believe where in the world we are today? It's amazing. You know, if you had asked me six weeks ago, where would I be today physically? What would I be working on? It would have reflected almost none of this. Uh, Of course, six weeks ago, six weeks plus, we began to understand the enormity and the severity of this crisis. But perhaps we were just on the precipice of really getting the gravity of this pandemic and what it was going to mean for our nation, other nations, the rest of the world. And it just goes to show that uh, we have such an overestimation of what we can plan for in life. We have all these notions of what we're going to do, where we're going to go, how things are going to be. Now, there's a quote that is often misattributed to Napoleon. It wasn't uttered by Napoleon. It was uttered by a, a Prussian general. And that is, every plan immediately fails upon contact with the enemy. So if I can extend the martial uh, anecdote, yes, you know, the, 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 the point that was being made is simply that you can plan all you want, but patterns that are so much larger than our capacity for perspective are going to play out. And here we are. It is, it is hard to believe. It's defining our generation. It's defining the decade. Yeah. And no one could have fathomed it uh, several months ago. Yeah. And and to me, when I think of best laid plans, I think of a business plan, which to me, a business plan is fantastic for getting your loan, hopefully, and is great until you put the key in the door. <laughs> and as yep. soon as you turn that key, it's all out the window and maybe now more than ever. So diving really deep into things, what does hope mean for you? It's funny that you asked this question because just this morning I was thinking back on a a book that I published, not one that I wrote, but that I published in January of 2017 called Expect Great Things by uh, Kevin Dan. It's a biography of Henry David Thoreau. And one of the things that Thoreau wrote in his journals, uh, which gave the book its title, is that we very often uh, receive what we expect. We very often receive what we go looking for. Hence, it is crucial that you expect great things. So I suppose I, I think in those terms, more than I think in terms of hope, I do believe in principles of mind causality, even as I also believe in these vast, vast seismic shifts that we have to live with as well. Because one thing is going on, it doesn't mean another thing's not going on also. And one of the points I've always tried to make about mind metaphysics, about mental creativity, is that I do believe it's a law. I do believe it's ever operative. I do believe it's a constant factor in our life. But I don't believe that means we don't also live under other laws and forces. I don't think in terms of one overall mental super law. For example, the placebo response, Mm -hmm. that's a constant. We know this. It's no one questions the data. They may question the implications. They may, we may question what's going on, which we really don't know. But that there is a placebo response is settled. That doesn't mean that other things are not also happening in terms of your recovery. That doesn't mean the placebo response is the one and only thing that's governing what's happening to you. It is a very, very important thing. It is an ever-operative thing, just like mental causation. But 
there's other things happening that affect how you experience the placebo response. Just like gravity is a constant law, but mass affects gravity. So if you're in the vacuum of space, you're not gonna feel the impact of gravity, even though it does exist, it is a constant. So rather than thinking in terms of hope, I think in terms of the constancy of mental causation, which isn't going to give me a precise prescriptive tool, but it is a part of my life, your life, the Inspire Nation listeners' lives, and that's so vital. It's so vital to understand that because we do have a, a measure of control over what to expect, and it's a measure of control that's constant, that's ever operative, but it's not, it's not exclusive. So we can bow, we can bow to the statement that every plan immediately fails upon contact with reality. <laughs> yeah. We can bow to that, but we can also bow to the statement made by Thoreau that you're very, very likely to get what you go looking for, so expect great things. Both are true, both are true. Thank you. We're, we're going to dive into Viktor Frankl and his story uh, and man's search for meaning here in a moment. And one of those, one of the most, and, and he was he was an interesting mix. He was one hell of a scientist. He was also a survivor. He was also, oh my God, he was so many different things. But one of the things that he talks about is the power of love. And, and mm -hmm. when I was reading the various news this morning, the only thing that came to me is I want a thousand people in my next class. I don't care what it's going to take. We have to come together. We have to come together. We have to come together. And I've been walking around this morning going, we have to come together, have to come together. How do we realize that the side to be on is humanity? I wish I could give you a beautiful answer to that question. <laughs> After all, this is supposed to be a show about hope. And, and I don't yeah, you're, you're scaring me here, Mitch. No, no, no. <laughs> right. You're like digging your, your hands into your thighs as we're talking. <laughs> this is supposed to be a show about hope, and I don't want people to change the channel. But there are some people who cannot be brought around to that thinking and that point of view. And as evidence, uh, uh, you, you need only scroll the, the viewer comments you know, for this show, I'm sure there are going to be hateful, angry comments, most of them anonymous. Far, far you fewer than you think. I have, I have been amazed, amazed, blown away by our audience. Maybe it hasn't hit that critical mass. We're doing awesome. Maybe it hasn't hit that yet. But the trolls, as a general rule, have been leaving us alone. Oh, that's great. Well, I, I hope to reverse that with today's show. No, I'm Josh. <laughs> no, we're on such, an, up, and, up, such and, an upward spiral, though, because people are looking yeah. for what we have to share right now. I totally dig that. And I've, I say this virtually every show, and I say it simply because I mean it. The Inspire Nation listeners are absolutely the best, most constructive metaphysical audience on the web, period. Because, And I know this Thank you, because I've received so many emails and and messages from your listeners and they are almost to a person constructive capable forward-looking practical and intelligent so i must never neglect to say that of course when we venture into politics you also attract people who are not listeners mm -hmm. but who are just driving by the neighborhood and want to throw a rock out their window <laughs> so you're going to get some of that too and i guess what i'm trying to say michael is that we're not going to get everybody on the side of constructive behavior. It's not going to happen because I, 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 it seems to me that, that, that we as a society are not built that way. We don't think in those terms that way in this particular generation. There's not a social polity that seems to touch everybody. And that's unfortunate, but it's the way things are. So I would say that what you and, and, and the Inspire Nation listeners have to do is assemble into communities of constructiveness and assemble into communities of mature, responsive, practical behavior. And don't spend too much time fretting if you can't get everybody in the door to that particular community. That community, as I'm describing it, is the majority. It is the majority. Strengthen that community, strengthen those bonds, be responsible, and don't fret if there's people who just can't live with that. 
we just came up last night, and 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 so it's so cool that you said this. We really get to dump, dump, dive into Viktor Frankl, but I'm taking this as a, as a call from the universe. Last night we came up with ink, um, and and we had a, a class of a few hundred people last night, and we said we're going to start. We got to start something like AmeriCorps, um, and and we're like, what about Inspire Nation Corps? And it hit a chord, and so today That's we've great. been saying we need to start the Inspire Nation Corps, and you're going. Michael, you need to assemble into communities. And I'm going, woohoo! <laughs> well, that's a very large community. I mean, you, you have one of the largest communities online in terms of metaphysical subject matter. So I think that's quite, that's quite wonderful. That's quite wonderful. I think you're getting the right message. So thank you, thank you. All right. Tell us about Viktor Frankl because he went through the most, well, he wouldn't even write about how horrific the experience was in many ways in Auschwitz, but he came out, I'm going to say for the betterment of man. How would you describe him, what he went through? Well, Viktor Frankl has been an enormous inspiration on me and on you and on many people. Uh, he was a um, Austrian Jewish uh, psychoanalyst who was imprisoned in Auschwitz uh, during the Second World War, and against all odds and expectations, he emerged alive from Auschwitz, and following the war, he wrote a book, which he initially intended to be anonymous, called Man's Search for Meaning. And in that book, he made the case that one of the factors, perhaps the primary factor, that allowed him to survive the devastating conditions that he faced during his internment at Auschwitz was a sense of purpose, a wish to complete his research, a wish to make observations about those traits in human nature mm -hmm. that are adaptable, functional, and constructive during periods of the most grave and unthinkable crisis. And his wish, while he was uh, interred, was to bring this philosophical outlook to the world. And the outlook was, in a nutshell, a phrase that he used himself, in a nutshell, was simply that no single trait in the human condition is more strengthening, is more fortifying than the search for meaning. The capacity to find meaning and intelligent symmetry within a situation. The capacity to be goal-oriented under circumstances of extreme duress lends the individual tremendous, tremendous fortitude. And the, the example that Frankel always used to illustrate this was that of a mountain climber. You've got mountains in the background, actually, yes. so this is sort of another portentous um, indication. The primary example that Frankel used was that if you are climbing a mountain and you experience extreme physical exhaustion to the point where your spirits and your physicality are strained almost to the breaking point and you look up and you see the peak within sight, you will feel re-energized. You will have the capacity to go on. Call it whatever you like. Call it a second win. Call it an improvement to your morale. I'm sure there are biological um, uh, correlations to what's going on, but there's probably a lot of different things that are going on, not just one thing. This is something that you and I were talking about earlier, um, apropos of the placebo effect in medicine. doesn't mean it's the only thing going on. There are lots of things going on in the human situation at any given moment. But Frankel made the point that if you're climbing and you're facing collapse and exhaustion and you see the peak, that instills in you a sense of meaning, purpose, possibility, goal. And you will be psychologically and physically fortified in ways that you could never imagine without that. Let's say the peak is a quarter mile off. Without seeing that peak, without having that, that vantage point, you really might not be able to go on for another quarter mile. But if you see that peak, suddenly that quarter mile becomes doable. And he felt that therein lies a great secret of the human condition. And he, his wish when he was in a concentration camp was to bring this outlook to the public. And he felt that that very wish 
uh, sustained and fortified him at times where he otherwise would have died. He had, I mean, you're talking about hiking to a peak. He's somebody who they were all experiencing such a edema in the camps. They couldn't put their fit, their swollen feet in their shoes. He couldn't put socks on. This was the winter. This was snow. This was no yeah. gloves. This was no food. This was no anything. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. yet he had his peak, his meaning that carried him through. And that's what I kind of want to dive into here today, is where we can look for meaning during this time. Because it, it's, it's crazy to think about, but they are in Auschwitz, in a place where he said the odds are one out of 28. And even till the last minute of the last day when his friends are getting carted off to safety and it turns out they all then got killed, and the, the tables could have turned on him, but he was able to hold on to meaning even in the darkest moments. Mm -hmm. How do we start to do this when we've lost our jobs, when we might lose our homes, when the check hasn't appeared, when a, when a, when a, when a, when a. I don't want to paint things as dark, but what are the different ways that we can pull out our climbing axe and stick it into something right now? Well, those are very heavy questions, and I'm glad you framed them as you did because there's no doubt that there are people listening who are facing right now exactly what you just described. And I can't pretend that I have easy answers or principles for every one of those people, but I would say there are things that will help point us in the direction of true north or point us in the direction of that mountain peak. One of those things, I believe, first and foremost, is it is profoundly important either in your domestic situation to the greatest degree possible and in your digital communities, which play a vital part in our lives at any time, but now even more than they usually do. Be around and in the company and, and within communication circles with positive, productive people. Eschew hate. Eschew sarcasm, eschew cruelty, eschew passive aggression. It's so important to the greatest extent possible that you be around people who provide you with constructive, positive, practical, forward-looking ways of life. This is not a time for sarcasm. This is not a time for hate. This is not a time for emotional outbursts. This is not a time for passive aggression. And in fact, passive aggression and gaslighting is almost worse than the other stuff I'm describing because it always comes with plausible denial. Mm -hmm. I said to somebody the other day that passive aggression is kind of a, a bastard cousin to gaslighting. And these are very psychologically depleting things that we visit upon one another. And if you think that somebody is gaslighting you, if you think that somebody is directing passive aggressive remarks at you, unfortunately, you're probably correct. Oh, no. You're probably <laughs> correct. It's not all in your head. And don't let them tell you it's in your head because that very default is what gives power mm -hmm to people who are bullying us or depleting us, or maybe just have some jealousies or something they're trying to work out. And so they couch it in passive aggressive remarks or backhanded compliments or what have you. The point is get away from those people. Sometimes you can't get away from the thing that's tormenting you and, and it's just a physical reality. At such times, take an internal vow to separate as much as you possibly can and at the first moment where you're able to physically separate, do so, do so. So that's one. It's absolutely vital that you cultivate productive company, whether in your domicile, in your workplace, if you're working, and online. I'm going to add something funny to it because we're in a place of synchronicities. We started a class this Monday. It goes through tomorrow. We'll have it as a, as a people can get it as a recording if, if they want. Um, but I'm calling it a class of alchemy. It's a class where we use tapping and we do some special subconscious reprogramming wow. with our tapping. Specifically, it says to take your fear and anxiety and turn it into positive, productive energy. That's great. 
that's absolutely wonderful. Well, speaking of alchemy, yes. one of the books that I'm most dedicated to is a 1908 metaphysical book called The Kabbalion, which you and yes, many yes. of your listeners know. And I actually just finished writing a study guide to The Kabbalion, which will be coming out a little bit later this year. And I, I love that book very, very deeply. That book has really historically integral adaptations of hermetic psychology and mental alchemy tucked throughout it. It's a very important book. One of the central points of the Kabbalion is that life functions on a sliding scale and that there is within everything a polarity. Mm -hmm. And if you can locate the polarity, the opposite polarity of whatever you're feeling, you can, through an act of conscious suggestion, focus, willpower, slide the scale from one emotional state to another. So for example, you can slide the scale from fear mm -hmm. to bravery or resolve. You can, and this happens all the time, scales, uh, uh, the scale slides from say love to hate or vice versa. It doesn't mean that you necessarily go from one extreme to another because it's very frequent that our feelings are not in extreme states. A person who's feeling fear might not be struck with terror, but they might be feeling a kind of low-grade anxiety. That can slide in the direction of courage through awareness and conscious auto-suggestion and will. It's something to experiment with. Now, one of the interesting things that I came to as I was writing this study guide is that in order to affect this this sliding scale in order to use suggestion focus concentration will to slide from one place to another you need to know or have a real heartfelt sense of what the opposing polarity is yes. and i asked myself if i'm dealing with anger mm -hmm. what's the opposing polarity to anger and some people might want to say well it's love for me Anger is an absence of power. Ultimately, it's an absence of power. I think anger grows from feelings of powerlessness. And the opposite of, of anger is a feeling of empowerment. Put whatever word you want on it. I don't know that my choice of words is, is precise. But if you can identify that sliding scale, that will aid you tremendously in undertaking that process of mental alchemy. So so let's let's play with that for a minute. I'm so glad that you that you went here today, Mitch. And we're we're gonna have you back shortly and, and go over your that your whole guide. I'm looking forward Everything. to it. <laughs> but let's play with a little bit of alchemy. You're at home, the check hasn't come. Thankfully they haven't turned off the water yet. Everything that's coming in to, uh, at you says be angry at this, be angry at that, be angry at the other thing. And you're going WTF again that scientific term how do we start to experiment with taking our fear to bravery, to resolve, or to courage, or say, all right, there has to be something I get to do, which is man's search for meaning, to take action, but how do I switch this energy? And I'm so big on not labeling energy good or bad. It's just holding big energy right now. How do we transmute that into fuel? If I was facing the situation that you just described, I would, of course, feel the same gamut of emotions that everybody listening feels. It's frustrating, it's unfair, and it's frightening. I would say, first of all, it's profoundly important that you not use your passions, but that you use your intellect in such a situation. That's based on something that a spiritual teacher said to me years ago. I was having a problem with somebody, and he said, don't don't use your passions, use your intellect. And I thought, okay, that, that gave me a, a, a valuable piece of the puzzle. And so I would say that if you're dealing with the problem of a late or missing check or a unpaid health claim and you have financial burdens weighing upon you, first and foremost, it's really important to sit down and intellectually formulate some positive, constructive, practical, actual, concrete possibilities that you can take. Yeah. Who can you call? Who can you appeal to? 
can you put off the payment of this check, uh, the, this bill? Can you go, no one, no one wants to, but can you go further into debt in order to bridge it? What concrete steps can you take that are not based on your emotions, but that are based on your intellect? So I would say that is one profoundly important step. The other thing is, and this re-enters the emotional territory, there are different actors within the world who we have to reach out to for help sometimes. Sometimes we're not able to reach these people. You may be waiting on hold for God knows how long to try to find somebody at your bank, yeah. to try to find somebody at your credit card company, to try to find somebody at your, your health insurance um, profiteer. And it, 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 that's, a, that's another problem in and of itself. But if you can reach somebody mm -hmm. who's in a position to help you, you have got to treat that person with the utmost respect because they are not the policymaker. They are not the person who's visiting this upon you. They are doing a job, and within that job, their hands are tied, but they also have more latitude than is often acknowledged. And you've got to try to reach out to these people who can help you in a way that is emotionally very, very respectful. They're dealing with terrible stress all day long. So again, you know, it's re-entering emotional territory, but it's re-entering it with purpose. You've got to appeal to different actors in our society who are in a position to assist you in ways that are absolutely productively respectful. And we all have greater mental and emotional reserves than we acknowledge. It's a fact of life. This is a time where you have to draw upon those reserves. There will be other times for getting angry. There will be other times for getting fearful. I'm not pretending those emotions go away. I feel the gamut of them myself. But you need to make a bargain with yourself. You need to make a bargain with your psyche in a certain sense yeah. and say, look, I'm an emotional being. That is not going to change. I am not from the planet Vulcan. I am from the planet Earth. And I have emotions. And Now more than ever. <laughs> now more than ever. And, I, and I'm going to honor those emotions. I'm going to honor those emotions. But not right now. But not right now. I will honor those emotions later. I will honor them tonight. I will honor them tomorrow. I will honor them when I'm talking to my shrink. Whatever it may be. I'm going to honor those emotions and I'm not going to make believe that they aren't there, but I have to strike this bargain where I defer them, defer them, defer your emotions, treat people with the deepest of respect and rely upon your intellect. May not be a magic wand, may not make everything come together, but I do believe that that sets you up for the best possible outcome. You just got me thinking, I did a, a, a recent interview with uh, Joel Fatinos on uh, Scoville Shin and, and playing the game of life. And, and I'm going back, I'm bringing, I'm sewing this right back to Auschwitz. And the first day that, uh, that he's in this concentration camp and he made a deal with himself that he was not going to gonna go what he called run for the wire. And to run for the wire is there's an electrical wire around the, the encampment where you would instantly check out if you touch this. And he made a bargain with his psyche that uh, Victor made a bargain that he would just take it in essence one step by step, but he wouldn't go for that wire. In mm -hmm. essence, it sounds like what he was doing and what you're suggesting is at this time, we make a very serious, but a game out of it. I can remember after my first NDE choosing for a positive outcome because I said, I don't, have the, uh, I don't have the resources to deal with the mental bandwidth of choosing anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, it's interesting that you bring up Shin because Shin was a big admirer of this book, The Kabbalion, that I was talking about. Cool. And The Kabbalion, written in 1908, a um, couple of decades before uh, Florence's first book, that book makes the first metaphysical reference that I've ever personally encountered to the phrase game of life, game of life. So a lot of the Kabbalion has to do with pitting laws that we live under against 
one another, making bargains with our psyche, arriving at the proper admixture that will permit us to function as highly as possible. So in a certain sense, although Viktor Frankl was writing from the most extreme of circumstances, he was talking about this notion of striking an internal bargain with oneself, of thinking strategically on an intellectual level, on a physical level, on an emotional level. And I believe we have to learn from that. We, we, we have to learn from that. How do we make that bargain with ourselves if we feel, and he said he could tell right away when a person wasn't going to make it, when yes. they had flipped the off switch. How do we make a bargain with ourselves when it is so... The word that comes to me when I'm working with my, my students this week is exhaustion. People are yes. completely exhausted. And I think part of that is, is the, the, I'll call it the Akashic field of, which is what uh, Irvin Laszlo would call it, this field of exhaustion. But it's also, we are being dumped on, heaped on us. Even if you don't follow any information, we are being heaped on an overwhelm. Well, I think it's important, first and foremost, for ourselves and for people around us and for the Inspire Nation listeners to be seen and to be acknowledged. There are injustices in our world. There are injustices in our world. Now, private health insurance companies in the United States have a policy of denying a certain number of legitimate claims in order to maintain profit margin. We don't know what number of legitimate claims because we don't have adequate transparency. It's another legal problem we face in our society. There aren't daylight laws mm -hmm. that allow us to know these policies. But everybody who has ever had to deal with their insurance company and had a legitimate claim rejected, which I'm betting is basically everybody listening right now, knows the truth of what I'm describing. It's terrible. It's terrible. And it's not going to change overnight. So first and foremost, I think it's important that people be seen. And that it be acknowledged that there are injustices in the world. And that is absolutely true. However, we have a part to play in that. We have a role to play in that. One of the books that has meant the most to me, uh, it's actually three books. It's the memoirs of Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist hero. The centerpiece of all three of Douglass's memoirs is that uh, when he was about 15 years old, he stood up to a cruel slave master, and they fought for two hours, and the slave master was incapable of getting the better of Douglas, and Douglas said that at that time in his life, he felt he had undergone an internal revolution where he had asserted his personhood and separated himself psychologically from slavery. But what a lot of people forget is that he did not escape slavery. He did not escape to the North um, for about another three years. He made one attempt that failed, and then he made another attempt that succeeded. So the horrible injustice that he was living under mm -hmm. did not lift as an outer fact for three years. So you have to live with that. You have to live with that. Frederick remained in bondage for three years. But the very fact that he had made that mental shift, so he wrote in his books, permitted him at the first possible opportunity to make his break, to become physically free. So it's profoundly important to remember that making that bargain with yourself, deciding that these circumstances are not going to crush me. I am going to separate from them. It might not mean that today or tomorrow or next week there is a shift in circumstance, although I wouldn't rule it out. I would not rule it out. There could be. But it will come. It will come, barring some enormous countervailing force. It will come. It came for Frederick Douglass. And I just want people to know that we're not talking about fantasy here. We're not wishing away your problems we're not engaging in some sort of uh, myopic language. Uh, there are no Stuart Smalley affirmations here, although I like Stuart. And we're certainly not talking about a turning a blind eye to injustice. Those factors are real, but so is your capacity for 
self-perception, self-suggestion, mental causation. Those things are real too. Use them, use them. And even if it takes three years, barring some extreme countervailing measure, you will get where you need to go. Thank you. I'm thinking of, of Viktor Frankl, who at one point, he manages, I think, to get some shreds of paper yes. and starts writing down the tiniest little bit of his book, his manuscript that he had literally smuggled in. It was the one thing he got to take in with him to Auschwitz, which he probably made it with him about all of five minutes, maybe less, one to two minutes. But just the act of knowing I'm going to try to write this down was a big switch for him. How do we find, we're talking man's search for meaning, a definite chief aim during this time? Because to me, that can carry us three years or whatever it takes. Without question. Without question. Um, that is my central outlook. I do believe that nothing is more fortifying your mental energies of your capacity for mental causation, self-creation, than the possession of a passionately felt definite chief aim. It's the closest thing that we possess to a magic key that opens up life's doors. Again, it's not the only thing that's going on, but it is a very powerful transcendent bargain that life strikes with us, that if you have a definite chief aim, then you will be able to open up and tap psychical energies that would otherwise be unavailable to you. The first step to a definite chief aim is absolute stark self-honesty. You have to ask yourself in a very specific way, what do I want in life? And when you ask yourself that question, you must ask it without embarrassment, without parameter, without this imaginary peer group in your head that's going to judge you. It's also important that you not just disclose this definite chief aim to anybody. In fact, I recommend not disclosing it to anyone unless you feel that individual is a truly, truly trusted confidant. Because people will very often reflect back at you their own fears, their own limitations, their own jealousies, their own unspoken hostilities, their own uh, wounded egos in trying to run down your aim. And it's none of their business. It's yours. It belongs to you. They're not an expert in your life. Only, only you can occupy that seat. So don't go rushing to tell anybody. And in fact, unless there's a need to, or there's something fortifying about it, I recommend you not tell anybody at all. Don't select an aim that you think is going to make you look good to some internal critic or to some peer group or measure it against some spiritual philosophy that may have been devised in a different language 3,000 years ago and that actually has nothing to do with your life, your geography, your needs today. It's your exquisitely private, true, actionable, passionate aim. What is it? What is it? And I don't care if it's surface oriented. I don't care if it's so-called materialist. I don't make these distinctions in life. I think they're all artificial inner, outer, attachment, non-attachment, identification, non-identification. I think most of these, these designations are artificial. The only thing I strive to live by is an ethic of nonviolence, which means very simply not doing anything to violate another individual's progress toward his or her own highest self potential. If I'm not disrupting another person's ability to express his or her highest potential, that that I I I have I have I have satisfied my own ethical standards, which are really just standards of reciprocity. So yes, ethics matter. Ethics matter insofar as we're all one human whole, and whatever you do to another, you do do to yourself. You may feel that on a far away scale, you may feel that on an immediate scale, but it is the truth. So there is an ethical dimension to life, always and everywhere. But beyond that, I want you to feel completely at liberty in selecting your aim. Once you select this aim, once you select this aim, if you've really been passionately honest about it, it will unlock energies and possibilities. There's no greater single step that you can do for yourself. Woohoo! Going back to stark self-honesty, what do I want in life? I'm going to guess that you would agree that we get to put that out there irregardless of how our life situations, uh, a situation appears 
now. For instance, Viktor Frankl's going, I've got to get this book out. Life looked like, am I even going to make it through this hour and the beating that I'm getting from the guard, let alone this day? But irregardless of those outer circumstances, we are honest and set that for ourselves. I, I agree with that, although I would also say that an aim, in order to be an actual aim and not just escapism and not just entertainment and not just self-indulgence, it must be actionable. There must be some steps that you can take in however nascent and small way in the direction of that aim. For an aim to be authentic, it must be action-oriented. It must translate into some sort of steps, however nascent. Now, for Viktor Frankl, for example, you said he had found scraps of paper and he began to, to take notes when he was capable. Well, for Frederick Douglass, when he was enslaved in Baltimore, the mistress of the household where Frederick was enslaved began to teach him to read. And the master of the household learned about it and put a stop to it. But Frederick would find little scraps of newspaper or labels on the street, in the trash, wherever he could. And he would use those things to further build his capacities for reading, writing, literacy. The point is, even in the most adverse of circumstances, you have to be able to take some steps, however small they may seem, in the direction of your aim. Otherwise, I think you're probably engaged in escapism. So don't permit limits, but also don't put yourself into a situation where you don't have something to do. I think you should always have something uh, to do, however small it may be. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I want to go from, from definite chief aim to looking at the struggles that we're going through right now. And there's a quote that just keeps hitting me in the face from Viktor Frankl's book, from his part on logotherapy. And it was actually, it's, it's quoting another author, Spinoza. And, and I'll, I'll begin the quote in Latin. Then I'm going to stop butchering my Latin and I'm going to go to English on it. Affectus qui passio est, desinet esse passio simultique, isu clarum et distinctum formamus idiom, emotion, which is suffering, ceases to be suffering as soon as we have a clear and precise picture of it. Mm, that's fascinating. That's absolutely fascinating. That reminds me of the principle in the Kabbalion about emotion occupying a sliding scale of polarity. It is difficult for us to understand how that process could work why that process can be transformative unless we are fully cognizant of what we're experiencing, which is what Spinoza is driving us towards. Cognizance of what we're experiencing not only allows us to observe it, but allows us to conceive of what the opposite, what the opposing polarity of that emotion is which permits transformation to take effect, at least in terms of the psychology that appears in the Kabbalion. But the very capacity to observe something is one of the greatest pieces of human agency, and we don't exercise it often enough because we don't know what we are experiencing. We sometimes turn our experiences into words that don't really capture what we're going through. And I think we have to be very primal with ourselves. Am I feeling fear? Am I feeling anger? Am I feeling threatened? You know, what, what am I feeling? What am I, what am I going through? If you're unhappy, acknowledge that you're unhappy. Acknowledge that you're unhappy. The very acknowledgement of that may lead you to become aware, for example, that you're in the wrong environment. Let's say. You might not be able to change environments. It might not seem possible. And yet the very knowledge that you're in the wrong environment is so powerful because at least, at least you have a diagram of the, the, the lock that's holding you in. You may not have the key to the lock yet, but you have a diagram. And you're very, very close to getting out of there once you have that diagram. There's one emotion that seems to be striking a lot of people that people are maybe surprised at or don't realize. Maybe it's sneaking in the back door. And maybe you can talk to me about working with this emotion and how we can maybe transmute it grief or maybe grief to hope because people are experiencing a lot of loss and don't even have that maybe awareness until this moment until i said it might be grief to to put our finger on it 
That's a wonderful question. I, I've been through periods like that myself. I've been through periods where I felt terrible anxiety. And it dawned on me that possibly the the thing that I'm calling anxiety is grief, is the mourning of a of, of a lost relationship or a lost set of circumstances or a lost sense of self. Or it could be uh, grief brought on by the onset of death you know, of someone that we love. So I think that's very real and that's very actual. And we probably experience grief more often than we know, but we put different labels on it. We might describe what we're going through physically and we say, my God, you know, I feel so anxious, I can't sit still. But I would say it's worth examining whether what we're experiencing at such moments is grief. Thank you. Any last, if we went to the Kabbalion, we're talking a little bit, I guess what we've been doing today without maybe even fully realizing it is we're going from, we're transmuting this energy of fear, of worry, and of anxiety to hope, and then even beyond that to a definite chief aim to action. Any one last point from the Kabbalion having to do with this transmutation you'd want to bring up? I think the point that I'd want to make from the Kabbalion is a point that resonates throughout Hermetic wisdom. Hermetic wisdom is sort of a time capsule of wisdom from ancient Egypt that was set down into uh, Greek literary style in the decades following Christ. And it's this notion of as above, so below, as above, so below. That's the primary principle of Hermeticism. It's the pivot point of the Kabbalion, and it comports with an expression found in Western scripture, probably shouldn't call it Western scripture, it doesn't belong to the West, uh, which is that God created man in his own image. As we are created in the image of the highest point of creation, so are we capable of creating within our own physical spheres, as above, so below. Remember that as your birthright, and if you take that statement seriously, as I urge you to do, then you have to take seriously the fact that you are possessed of creative abilities within your own sphere of existence. And those abilities go beyond cognition and motor function. We know this because of a whole range of testimony from seekers and also from findings in the sciences, which we'll touch on another another show. We've talked briefly about the placebo effect. We can talk about neuroplasticity, quantum theory, all kinds of variants of mind-body medicine, neuroscience, and psychical research, all of which point to the fact that we lead an immaterial existence. We lead a metaphysical existence in addition to the physical existence that we know day to day, hour to hour. With that knowledge, as with knowledge of what you're going through emotionally, you have a, a higher capacity to evaluate who you are, where you are, and what's possible in life. As above, so below. Always remember that you have an existence as a creative being, and it is more limitless uh, than what we often understand. Woohoo! Bringing that right back to Viktor Frankl, he talks about even though the, alt, the outer landscape may be dim, the inner mm. landscape can be rich. And this can be, I don't want to pile on the doings on anybody if we're feeling overwhelmed at this time, but you can dive in and start to create an inner world, which will then be uh, sooner or later will be reflected in your outer quote reality. Absolutely. I mean, again, it took Frederick Douglass three years to free himself from bondage. You may be in a situation right now where you're on lockdown with somebody who saps your energies and it seems terrible and you're thinking, well, gee, all this sounds wonderful, but I can't get out of here. I'm responsible for caring for this person or whatever. And my heart goes out to you. These are real situations and they can be very unfair. However, the page can also turn. It can turn very suddenly and you may be surprised. Strange things happen all the time. In as much as we are visited by tragedies or catastrophes in life, so are we also visited by absurdly unexpected, wonderful developments. Of course it happens. We call them miracles. A miracle very simply is a fortuitous circumstance that exceeds all expectation. Of course they happen. Of course they happen. We're living under a pandemic right now. No one expected this. 
you know, uh, several months ago. No one had any foresight about any of this. Terrible things happen and miracles happen. So what may seem unchanging, it could change very, very suddenly. It happens. It does happen. It may not happen, but a change that's gradual will also come about, but it has to start with intention. And you have that power. You have that capacity. Woohoo! And there's, there's a term I've been using a lot lately, which is critical mass. Which Critical is it, mind as maker. As we focus on what we want, what we desire, I truly believe there can be a positive critical mass. I think right now we could be creating a collective nightmare, but we could also create an electron state change and actually shift humanity to a new level if that is where we put our intention, attention mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. intention at this time. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think that's perfectly put. Why would the laws of nature differ from the laws of our own psyches? Of course not. Again, as above, so below. There's a mirror effect in everything. There's a polarity in everything. If you observe something in nature, such as force arising from concentration, you concentrate photons into a beam, it eventually becomes a laser. You concentrate an air current or water into a very, very narrow channel presents an overwhelming force. Why should that not also be true of our individual psyches? There's something to learn from that with a question. Thank you. Any last words of wisdom you want to share with people, Mitch? You said hope at the beginning of the yes. at the beginning of the show. So I'll use that word because it's legitimate in this case. You mustn't give up hope. You mustn't give up the ideal that when you're faced with profound difficulty, Sometimes things do change quickly. We've talked about a lot of gradual change this show. We've talked about people who were in desperate situations and the way out couldn't be seen and the way out wasn't realized sometimes for several years. And that's reality too. But I would have to add to that in order to be fair to the human situation that profoundly difficult things can also change very, very quickly. And that is a fact. That is a fact. And if you're looking for hope, I don't offer cheap hope, and I don't offer myopic slogans, but in as much as life visits tragedy and catastrophe on us, so does it also visit on us absurdly good news, fortuitous circumstances that surpass all reasonable foresight. Those things are called miracles, and they do occur. They do occur, and it would be unrealistic not to believe that. Woohoo! I've got to add an addendum to it. I know you are giving final words, so I'm going to give you an opportunity for final, final words if you'd like. But I, I, here's why I see the greatest hope is, is that things are freaky tiki right now, but they're also light. We are at a place where foundations have been ripped apart. Everything yes. is unstable, is uneasy, which means we are light. We are able to pivot. Sure, we could pivot and spiral Absolutely. down, but we could also pivot and spiral up. We're unmoored, we're untethered, we're dangerous, and the positive is absolutely more possible than ever now in this moment. I agree with that, and I've been talking about that with friends over the past couple of weeks. We are at a point of a, a kind of dramatic reset within our lives and within broader spheres. I think that there is a quality of reset that is going on right now. It's funny, Michael, you know, I had these different speaking gigs around the nation that were going to take me on the road in April and May. And some of these gigs were what I call legacy gigs. They were arrangements that I had made a long time ago and that I was honoring because they were on my calendar and I'd agreed to them. And I thought, boy, you know, I don't want to do this. This isn't exactly the circumstances or the terms under which I'd like to be speaking, but it's a legacy gig, so I have to honor it. It's and your fault, I Mitch. Blinked it's my all eyes. your fault. <laughs> uh, I that far, but I blinked my eyes and they were all gone. And they were all gone. And you could call that happenstance, you could call it coincidence, you could call it whatever you want, but the fact is, we've all had similar experiences to a greater or lesser extent, because everything that we consider to be a, um, an obligation, an unavoidable relationship, a predictable uh, event, it's all gone, it's all gone. So that can feel very disorienting, but at the same time, it's also a great reset, and I would invite people to look at that uh, with an attitude of enthusiasm. Thank you. Where can people go, Mitch, to find your beautiful work and to find out more? 
Well, there's always my website, MitchHorowitz.com. Mm -hmm. uh, I have lots of books up at Amazon, and one that I want to mention right now because it's it's priced very inexpensively on Kindle, and that is uh, my most recent book, uh, Secrets of Self Mastery, which for the remainder of April is a a dollar ninety nine on Sweet. Kindle. So I, I I wanted to call that out, and then of course I'm on social media at Mitch Horowitz on Twitter, at Mitch Horowitz 23 on Instagram. I love hearing from Inspire Nation listeners. Uh, whenever I, I get a question or a comment from an Inspire Nation listener, I always write back. They always hear from me. You've got just the best community within digital culture as far as I'm concerned. So I'm always happy when I when I hear from your listeners. Thank you, Mitch. So for and thank you, listeners. I, this, my arms get cut off when I do this, but I'm putting all <laughs> of my listeners in my arms right now. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. You are the Inspire Nation Corps. You are the difference we want to make in the world. And if you're listening to this during this time, it means you haven't given up. You said there is a way out, and I'm going to say the way out is within at this time, but there is a way out of this for a more beautiful, hopeful future. Right on. right on. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the secrets of self-mastery, particularly in April, and begin diving deep and finding meaning in your life today and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Mitch. Absolutely, man. A pleasure. A pleasure. Just again, want to give a shout out to all the Inspire Nation listeners because I've been doing this show with you for perhaps three years or more, and I am continually struck by how constructive, how practical, how mature uh, the Inspire Nation uh, community is. And I just want to say, uh, you all are the ones who fix things. You all are the ones who are going to get us through this. You all are the ones on whose shoulders the world stands. So I, I just want to say a word of thanks to your listeners. If you like this video, then you're a light worker. You're a light warrior. And we need your love and light. We need to crank it up to the max. That's why we're offering boot camps. You can check them out down below. Monday through Friday events, one hour a day, almost free to help you crank your light up to the max, get you in the most positive place possible, boost your immune system to the max, and help you to help the world to shine bright. We're also offering YouTube live events every Saturday and Sunday during this time to help you overcome fear, overcome worry, overcome stress, and again, boost up your immune system. These tapping events, these boot camps, all involve group meditations where we come together, set group intention, help you help yourself, help your family, and help the entire world. You're a light worker. Your time is now, so come join us. Click below for these extra special events. I just had the most beautiful, hope-filled, inspiring, on fire, filled with alchemy interview with Mitch Horowitz on Secret of Self Mastery. To check out more uplifting, inspiring, alchemy-filled interviews, click here. Subscribe below. Click on that bell icon to be notified of upcoming shows, premieres, and lives. And be sure to join us for our next boot camp. Simply click on the link below. And there's scholarships available if you can't make it. We want to help everyone at this time to absolutely, truly shine bright. Love you guys so, so much. Woohoo!